for my portion of this uh, session is to give an overview of uh, the typical management of the craniocervical junction uh, and the pathology in the region. My talk will unfortunately overlap with a couple of the talks, but uh, I'll try to give a brief kind of overview of how I approach craniocervical pathology um, and decision making. I have no disclosures. So we'll, we'll briefly go through some of the regional anatomy that um, uh, we, we look at when assessing uh, patients uh, with craniocervical disorders, including the bony anatomy, the adjacent neurovascular structures, and the associated ligaments. Uh, I'll touch on the biomechanics of that region and the importance, uh, emphasize of the uh, integrity of the ligament structures, which has relevance for, of course, EDS patients. And then uh, I'll give a, a overview of the surgical decision making uh, that we typically will use in, in spine surgery to assess whether someone needs surgery or not. So in terms of the bony anatomy of the craniocervical junction, this is a, a complex region. I won't go through to each individual part, but uh, needless to say, the, the top of the spine is unlike any other portion of the spine. Uh, the C1 and uh, C2 bones of the cervical spine, a very unique anatomy. So the bones below that look very different than the bones uh, of that region. One of the unique uh, uh, parts of the bony anatomy is the connections uh, and the articulations between the first and second bone. So people have alluded to uh, uh, folks undergoing fusions in this region. There's a lot of uh, motion uh, of these two bones on each other. I'll just uh, highlight just a couple parts because it's relevant for uh, management. The C2 bone has this little peg here that sticks out and articulates with the first uh, bone called the dens, uh, and a little ligament will hold that, uh, that, uh, that dens to the, the arch of C1, and that'll come up uh, again later. As far as the ligament anatomy, which is probably the most relevant for this session, um, the ligaments of the craniocervical junction play a, a very critical role for the structure and function of this region. Uh, in fact, it's probably the most uh, important part uh, for the function of the craniocervical junction. The, the back of uh, the C2 bone is connected directly to the back of the skull or the occiput uh, by several ligaments, namely the alar and apical ligaments, which are um, right here where I'm, I'm pointing on the pointer, uh, as well as the tectorial membrane, which is an extension of a ligament that goes up the back of the spine uh, up all the way up to the skull base. The transverse ligament is a, a ligament that attaches from the back of the, the C1 bone to across that little peg that I mentioned called the dens or odontoid process, and it holds that C2 bone or the C2 dens directly to the C1 arch. And uh, this is important when uh, we're assessing patients with either injury or disorders of ligaments in this region. In general, it's important to know that in, in an otherwise normal patient, there's a very low chance of injuring these ligaments. These in, ligaments are actually fairly strong in terms of uh, their ability to uh, accommodate stress. Um, in terms of the neurovascular anatomy, I won't, again, I won't go into too much detail on this, but there are several important blood vessels that we take into account when considering surgery in this region. Uh, these two pictures here illustrate the vertebral artery. The vertebral artery is obviously a very important blood vessel that supplies blood to the back of the brain, the brain stem. It travels through um, a little hole on the side of the cervical spine, um, uh, from usually from the sixth or seventh bone all the way up to uh, the first bone. And, and uh, the anatomy varies depending on where you're looking at the spine. You'll notice at the top of the cervical spine or the cranial cervical junction, it takes several loops uh, and those loops can vary tremendously from patient to patient and there are regional an uh, anatomy differences uh, that will often be seen that could, um, that won't look like the picture. So injury to these vessels can cause significant problems um, such as stroke, uh, which can be devastating, especially if it's a brain stem stroke. So we obviously have to take into account uh, the vertebral artery when we're considering surgery at the cranial cervical junction. For the biomechanics of the region, uh, this is something important to know for decision making for folks with connective tissue disorders. So um, between the bottom of the skull and C1, uh, there is a significant amount of flexion and extension of the cervical spine. In fact, uh, on a level by level basis, this is where most of the flexion and extension 
uh, the head versus uh, uh, articulating with the neck comes from. There's about 25 degrees of combined flexion and extension between the bottom of the skull and the first bone. Uh, and there's only very little uh, bending or rotation. Unlike the first and second bone, uh, when they join, they have about 20 degrees of flexion and extension, but about 40 degrees of axial rotation from one side and then 40 degrees to the other. So a significant amount of rotation occurs at C12. A significant amount of flexion and extension occurs uh, from the, the occiput to C1. Um, there's a famous uh, textbook by a couple of uh, physicians, White and Punjabi, that uh, established some basic criteria, uh, not scientifically necessarily validated, but some basic criteria for assessing stability of the cranial cervical region uh, based on its biomechanics. Um, one way to do that, or one way they, they described it is, is the rotation or flexion extension, is it more than normal, more than average? So at the bottom of the skull between that and C1, if you have more than eight degrees of rotation, which is beyond what normal, uh, is considered normal, perhaps there's some instability. Same thing with if there's any uh, evidence of translation of one on the other. Uh, between C1 and 2, if there's uh, more than 45 degrees of rotation, more than uh, four millimeters of translation on the first and second bone, in other words, if that ligament that holds the two bones together is disrupted or injured, um, that would also be considered unstable. There's a number of other uh, criteria, but um, this gives kind of a framework for how we assess as surgeons um, uh, whether there's any gross incompetence of ligament structures in the craniocervical junction. So what's the role of surgery of the craniocervical junction in general? Uh, in general, uh, our goal is to look at whether we can accomplish the following. Uh, so we decompress the spinal cord and nerve uh, neural elements. Uh, so at the cranial cervical junction, we're talking about the spinal cord. Uh, we're talking about nerve roots in the region. Uh, the C2 uh, nerve roots in particular are often compressed, uh, and the lower brainstem to the lower medullary region. We do that through a number of different methods, uh, either directly by removing structures or directly compressing those elements, or indirectly. Um, by a reduction of structures, meaning moving uh, bony elements or structures away from those regions, not removing them. Uh, and then we'll often stabilize this region through a number of different techniques, and which I'll mention, uh, usually through a combination of uh, uh, instrumentation. And ultimately, arthrodesis, which is the fusion part, when you hear about a fusion, arthrodesis refers to bone growth, um, not the hardware. The hardware is actually just a scaffold for the bone growth to occur. Um, uh, if you don't do the bone, if you don't have the bone growth and you just have the screws and rods or the instrumentation, uh, typically the, the instrumentation will fail over time. And we do that from uh, either the bottom of the skull on down to the subaxial spine uh, between the first and second bone or a combination of these. There are a number of different types of pathology in this region that we address surgically. Um, these are some example slides. Um, showing some of the, the, the rare, or the different types of uh, issues that we see, uh, ranging from trauma and fractures to uh, different inflammatory disorders, tumors of the region, uh, infection, congenital abnormalities, uh, degenerative abnormal pathology, and connected, uh, obviously connective tissue disorders. Uh, there are different methods uh, for decompressing that region. Uh, if you have any associated, in the case of Ehlers-Danlos or Chiari, if you have any associated compression of neural elements, uh, we'll often decompress those neural elements either from by removing part of the bottom of the, the back of the skull through a so-called suboccipital craniectomy or removing the back of those C1 or 2 bones to make more room uh, for the, the spinal cord. There's multiple ways to to get to this region from the front, uh, very rarely will we see this associated with uh, us doing these procedures with, uh, for folks with connective tissue disorders, but we will do them for other sorts of pathology, and those that are more involved, they often will entail either going through the mouth or splitting the jaw to get to this region, uh, or through a high incision on the, the top of the neck. These are often very morbid uh, approaches to access this region. So more often than not, if we end up doing surgery on folks with connective tissue disorders, they'll be from the back of the neck. This is just a picture from the Mayfield Clinic, uh, a nice illustration of what a, a decompression, typical decompression of the region looks like with uh, the bottom of the occiput and the suboccipital region removed to expose the, the bottom of the cerebellum. 
uh, and the back of the C1 arch removed to decompress uh, the spinal cord and cranial cervical uh, cranial medullary uh, junction. So this would be a typical um, decompression of this region. So how do we do surgery? Um, so I mentioned there's we go from the front or back to decompress. There's different ways to reconstruct or instrument the spine. Um, uh, again, a lot of the ventral approaches we don't typically do for the cranial cervical direction in the uh, connective tissue uh, disorder patients. Um, but there's multiple different techniques that I'll just show quick pictures of. And there's multiple dorsal techniques. Again, I won't go through all of them. This can take a whole day to cover cranial cervical junction uh, management. Um, but we'll focus on the more common ones that we'll see that we do, which is a screw fixation or putting in screws and rods to stabilize this region. I won't cover these, but uh, historically uh, we would uh, wire the uh, cranial cervical junction. We would put these uh, uh, metal wires across the back of these bones, the C1 and C2 bones, and then put little bone grafts in between them to eventually cause the fusion or the bone growth. These techniques were, were widely used for a while prior to the invention uh, uh, and the incorporation of uh, screws and rods, but they sometimes still have a role today, particularly if you have concomitant um, abnormal bony pathology in the region. So we'll, we'll sometimes still do these if we can't put um, uh, screws and rods in the region. So what does a typical screw rod construct look like at the cranial cervical junction? Uh, these are a few of my patients. Um, with different pathologies, but uh, they consist of several different types of instrumentation, uh, including occipital plates, so uh, metal plates that go and connect to the back of the skull that we attach with small screws, um, C1 lateral mass screws, or screws that go into the, the C, uh, thick portion of the C1 bone, uh, C2 screws that go into different portions of the C2 bone, there's different types of those, uh, and then screws further down uh, that we will sometimes incorporate as, a far, as part of a larger construct of the cranial cervical region. So this top one shows a typical occipital cervical construct in a patient with abnormal bony anatomy. Uh, and the one below this is a, a, a typical construct that incorporates uh, not only C2 but also C1 in the C3 and C4 region. And then, uh, as you've heard, a C12 instrument fusion will usually look like something like uh, the, the right uh, picture here. So this is an illustration. Uh, this is uh, from a, a paper from Hopkins um, of a typical occipital cervical fusion and what that looks like uh, graphically. And it involves um, attaching a, a metal plate to the back of the skull, connecting that to screws further down to basically immobilize that region, uh, to stabilize it and prevent movement. Uh, there's some risks associated with this. Um, um, whenever you fuse that region, as I mentioned, there's a lot of motion there. Uh, so you lose quite a bit of motion when you uh, stabilize that region. So for example, uh, if you uh, fuse across from the C1 and 2 uh, bones, you lose a significant n amount of rotation. As I mentioned, a lot of the rotation occurs between those bones. So if you're driving a car and you have a C12 bone, for example, fused together, it's very hard for you to turn your head to look behind you. That's a very common complaint. If you fuse, uh, if you go up further and, and incorporate the bottom of the skull, you, you're going to lose a lot of um, flexion extension of your neck. So looking up, looking down, um, this can be very debilitating. You know, in children, uh, it's usually pretty well tolerated. They could adapt by uh, flexing or rotating the, the, the parts of the spine further down, but in older adults uh, who have already significant range of motion limitations, this could be um, uh, quite cumbersome uh, when you can't move your neck uh, to a significant degree. There's also risks of causing swallowing dysfunction, particularly if you don't um, uh, fuse a person looking straight ahead. So there's some horror stories you'll hear where you know, the patient's looking up uh, permanently or looking down permanently. That could be very debilitating. Um, and there's a risk that if you're in that position um, uh, and you fuse, it becomes a significant uh, deformity problem. So uh, often those, those patients are very difficult to treat afterwards, after the fact. So you usually try to get it right the first time. Um, so uh, I just wanted to mention um, 
a couple, uh, an entity called basilar invagination or cranial settling. You'll hear about that in relationship to EDS or connective tissue uh, disorder patients. Uh, this is from a, a, a paper found by Botello. It was published in one of the neurosurgical jo uh, journals uh, illustrating what that looks like. That, that uh, portion of the C2 bone, the DENS or the odontoid process in this uh, illustrated patient is, is sticking into or invaginating into the bottom of the skull. Sometimes you'll, you'll hear about uh, the concept of cranial settling for EDS patients. And the idea is, okay, well, what can we do about it? Uh, well, one, this, this, this paper illustrates uh, is that they try to reduce it. They try to bring that bottom of the, or the, that C2 bone out of the bottom of the skull via reduction using uh, uh, traction. So you'll see this uh, bone here in the skull, and they pull it out, and then they instrument you. This is something we'll often do to see uh, or to try to indirectly decompress the spinal cord and brainstem and then fix it into place. We could also do that in surgery. Um, there's different methods of doing that. I won't go into the detail on any of that. And finally, decision making. Um, I'll just briefly touch on this. I know Dr. Rekate's going to touch on this for EDS, but the first part is to see, uh, figure out if you're symptomatic or not, and if so, what kind of symptoms? Uh, are there any compre uh, compression of any neural elements? And is there any evidence of instability? I think there's a talk in radiography of this region a little bit later. Uh, and then what's the underlying pathology? Um, this is actually a very uh, hot topic as far as EDS and stability, because we rely on uh, uh, surgeons to, to assess whether you need a uh, fusion or not. And there's different methods of doing that. Again, I won't go into too much detail, different indirect ra uh, radiographic markers on CT scans and x-rays. Uh, sometimes you'll get a dynamic scan. This is one of Dr. Klinga and I's patients, I believe, who uh, had a dynamic MRI done. And what you'll see is that when they, um, before and after um, uh, uh, flexion or extension, the, the part of the brainstem here, the DENS, is either is not compressing the brainstem uh, uh, here, and it is right here, so it'll push into the brainstem. You don't notice that in a static uh, MRI or uh, CT image. And there's folks looking at other different techniques, dynamic techniques, uh, including CT scans, to look for changes in those uh, radiographic markers of instability. This is a dynamic CT scan looking at different uh, measurements. And then finally, I just wanted to give a plug for some of the research that I'm trying to do um, with dynamic 3D segmentation of the upper cervical spine, where I could uh, I create 3D models of dynamic flexion and extension CAT scans and quantitate the, the changes that occur in either flexion or extension or rotation to determine if there's abnormal movement beyond what we would consider uh, um, uh, normal or abnormal. And these are some of the pretty pictures that you could get uh, and some of the quantitative analysis that you could get, which is kind of in, in its infancy, but could provide us a better way of uh, assessing stability of this region because it is somewhat hard to do and a little bit controversial in terms of how to do it. And with that, I think hopefully I'm on time.